Ceiling Unlimited. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Edward G. Robinson. I appear tonight for my friend Orson Welles, who is ill and cannot be with you. The builders of Lockheed and Vega aircraft bring you a story told by Mr. Robinson, who only recently had been sent as a special representative of the Office of War Information to England. He was flown there and came back by boat. And this is the story of what he learned. That I went to England and that I came back again are relatively unimportant facts. But the reason that my return by ship was uneventful, that's the story I want to tell you tonight. It's the story of how the transporting of millions of your sons and brothers to Europe and Africa has been made possible. There's a battle being fought over that Atlantic Ocean, the battle of the Eastern Sea Frontier. A hard, tough battle, one of the least publicized of the war, and one that we're winning. The story I'm going to tell you is a mixture of old facts no longer important to the enemy and some new facts scrambled up a bit because, of course, the full story can't be told. Well, not yet. There's a consolidated PBY bomber flying over a certain section of the North Atlantic Ocean. Come on board with me, but uh, never mind asking where we took off from this morning. It could have been somewhere in Iceland or in Newfoundland, down in the Caribbean or along our own mainland. The weather is damp and foggy. The cold winds from below push up on us and the plane bucks them constantly. The ocean below us isn't inviting looking. The waters are restless, repellent, slate gray in color. Since morning, we've been flying over one prescribed parallelogram of ocean. It's an eight to 10 hour duty. The crew is silent, all curiously tense. They seem constantly on the watch for something below. The men curse in low voices. The white caps make visibility tough over that ocean surface. Suddenly, the red-headed Texas lad in the tail of the ship stiffens and adjusts his headpiece. Bomber dear to pilot. Couple of points to these, fella. See anything? Could be. The plane banks slightly. Eyes all turn in the indicated direction. We lose altitude. Well, sure enough, the sharp eyes of that Texas lad spotted something that isn't a wave or a shark fin on those cold, dark, restless waters. The boys quickly identify it. Pilot to Bombardier. What do you think it was, a platter of hot roast turkey with cranberry sauce and mince pie? All right, so it's another busted orange crate. It's a change from nothing. Only a broken orange crate on the surface of the Atlantic Ocean. Yet apparently it can't be overlooked. The operator switches his radio to send. Patrol 16. Patrol 16 calling 4th District. Broken orange crate sighted. Broken orange crate floating. Broken orange crate... Why should these boys be concerned with a broken orange crate on the surface of the North Atlantic? Who ashore would be concerned? And why are these boys flying anyhow? What are they looking for? It strikes me as a hard, tough, thankless grind, the ceaseless patrolling over this huge gray ocean. Let's find out where that message about a broken orange crate ends up. Air controller speaking. Operations office, 4th District. Another report from patrols on floating debris in vicinity of latitude 3530, longitude 7510. Was the stuff identified? Yes, sir. Wish they'd radioed in about one of those long German cigars. They're getting scarce as hen's lower plates. But it was a broken orange crate. Checked and noted. The naval officer who just laid down that telephone sits with five other men, two of them also Navy men, three from the Navy at a long table in an extraordinary room. It's a huge glassed-in air-conditioned compartment, uh, well, something like a radio station's master control room. It exists, this room, somewhere on the east coast of North America. Of course, I can't tell you just where. The enemy would give too much to know. One of the naval men wears a commander's three stripes on his sleeve. He bears the title of air controller of the Eastern Sea Frontier. He is virtual strategist of the daily war against the Axis submarines in Atlantic waters. Messages keep coming in intermittently to be considered by the six men and their importance appraised. Before them hangs a huge metal map, 15 feet high by 30 wide, suspended from the ceiling. Everywhere on this map are little objects that, uh, from here, look like bugs. Oh, uh, what are they, Commander? Some are shaped like planes, others like submarines, Mr. Robinson. 
Those plasters there represent convoys bound for Europe, Russia, Africa, and elsewhere. Oh, yes, I see. Yes, and I notice that sailor moves them and uh, changes their position. Uh, how do they stay on the map? The markers are metal, and the map is magnetized. Well, ingenious, all right. This map tells these six men at a glance what goes on everywhere over the vast expanse of the Atlantic. It's a rather solemn thought that this room is the nerve center and controls the movements of everything on and above that great ocean. Oh, uh, by the way, Commander, how about that orange crate? Why is that important? Well, by itself, Mr. Robinson, one broken orange crate means nothing. But several objects of the same kind may mean a nearby sinking and possibly floating survivors. Oh, yes, of course. Well, it's the calmness and the thoroughness of this place that impresses you. Yes, but what are the Army and Navy doing together in this operation? It sounds like an exclusively naval responsibility, whatever it is. We're back with our friends in the consolidated PBY. The sun is going down in that murky, fog-driven sky. Hang it, I wish we could get a look at one of them Axis U-boats just for the fun of it. Now stick around, chum, you will. Ain't seen one in four days. You will, sooner or later. Submarines have to surface to charge their batteries. On that, they pin their hopes. Undersea boats, sooner or later, must come to the surface to breathe and regain their power. And once in a while, too seldom to suit them. Swing her over a couple of points, fella. If it's another orange crate, I'll murder you when we get home. Listen, if that's an orange crate, oh, I'm... pilot to Bombardier. Bombardier to pilot. Open Bombay. You fly her, I'll get her. Yes, there it is. A wash, a conning tower. Three men, three German sailors stand there on the ironwork, back to back, watching the skies. Our flaps are extended to cut our speed. Our entire crew is rigid, expectant. The radio operator is rapidly 16. manipulating his Control equipment. 16, subcontact. Subcontact, latitude, 3530, longitude, 7510, subcontact. The three sub sailors contact. on the conning tower have been watching the skies. Now they sight us. They scramble for safety, apparently shouting their warning. But they don't make it in time. Down, down goes the U-boat in a crash dive, leaving them struggling in the water. Axis undersea commanders no longer have time to think of the safety of their crews. Those three watchers are expendables to be expended when aircraft is sighted. Our plane swoops low. Arm bombs. Arms away. Our big plane drops depth charges ahead of the swirl where the sub dived. Our ship, flying over the explosions, bumps badly. The plane seems to go out of control as the altimeter flutters wildly and the compass spins dizzily. We bank sharply and come back, dropping more charges. Again we bank and return, and again. A noil slick appears on the surface of the water. It may mean death down there to that sea wolf. Crashing, crushing death with tons of water pouring in through ripped steel seams. And then again, it might not. Subs these days eject oil to put pursuers off the track. We throw a rubber life raft to the three wretched German youths down there in the ICC and resume our ceaseless patrolling. Did the air control headquarters get the message about the subcontact? The atmosphere in the control room is strained. The air controller glances at his watches of calculating when he'd get to mess when... Air controller? Yes? He leans forward ever so slightly. Something in his voice makes the other five men turn to him with a curiously expectant air. Repeat that, please. Operations Office, 4th District. Submarine contact reported. Where are we? Latitude 3530, longitude 7510. We have two PBYs ready to take off after it. You may release them. Yes. The kind of news they've been waiting for. A Naxxus submarine has been sighted. The commander turns to his assistant. 3530 and 7510. Mark two PBYs from the District J at once. Well, District F has a couple of Otsikorskis from, uh, not far from there, sir. We'll dispatch them. Yes, sir. We feel the gathering tension in the room. A vast machine has become aware of the location of an Axis submarine out there in the Atlantic and is moving swiftly to kill it. The assistant is already telephoning District F to send out the Wojciechowskis. The commander confers with one of the army men. There's an available bomber off point five, sir. Have her proceed to the attack and request two from the army field. Yes, sir. The major flips on a small microphone and gives orders quietly. Meanwhile, one of the naval men has scribbled orders which go down a pneumatic tube. In a few minutes, one or more surface craft on patrol will head for positions 3530 and 7510. 
Well, now the pattern of the whole thing becomes clear. Now we see the reason for it all. This is a joint Army-Navy operation under the direction of Vice Admiral Adolphus Andrews. Quietly, without fanfare, they have created this mechanism for the watching of an entire ocean. The facilities of one are the facilities of both. Will they get that sub? Our friends have been joined by their reinforcements from shore. The two PBYs, the two votes Sikorsky on patrol, the three army bombers. Now miles of sea area can be covered. We drop flares to mark where we side of the sub. Our one chance is that night is falling. Our boys mutter and curse the luck. Our radio is on. We're in communication with the other plane. Suddenly, we see one of the PBYs bank and... These are off, Fred. They've seen her. The PBYs drop a flare, but no depth charges. The honor is ours. We saw that sub. Besides, we're closer. Pilot to Bombardier. All set. Only two of them left, but I'll get her. We bank sharply, descend swiftly to the level of the flare dancing on that darkening sea. Our Bombardier does his duty. The PBY drops another flare. It floats lazily downward, comes to rest on the surface of the sea. It flickers there a moment, then suddenly spreads a little, and a smoky ring appears on the water. An oil slick. Everybody on board listens for the bombardier's report. Bombardier to all you goons. Sight itself, bomb same, if I must be original. Let's go home. I'm all in. And that's why I got back to America safely. There will soon come the day, please God, when that vast stretch of ocean now known as the Eastern Sea Frontier will return to its rightful status as a highway free to all. And when the tremendous story of the anti-submarine patrol may be told in all its detail. Meanwhile, its work goes on. Its romance and glamour exemplified in that glass-enclosed air-conditioned control room where before their enormous maps sit those quiet men of the Army and the Navy in unified command. And the hard, tough, thankless part of it exemplified in the planes that patrol the enormous stretch of sea from the Caribbean to Iceland. Here, American planes and flying men are doing one of the toughest jobs of the war. And in a sense, one of the least rewarding. A vast trap has been laid for the enemy there in the Atlantic. And patiently, men draw the lines tighter until one day they will have drawn a web impossible for the enemy to penetrate. On that day, we shall have won this war. And so, in war, we use the talents God gave us as hostages against defeat and despair, forever keeping before us the image of that for which we are fighting, the hushed and wishful twilight of November, the scent of autumn fires upon the air, and crowning these, the privileges we share, the way of life that is our own to cherish, the purpose and goal for which we dare, the faith we proudly keep that must not perish. Tonight's story, ladies and gentlemen, has been one of teamwork, of the Army and Navy working together to clear the sea lanes of Nazi subs. Much of the action took place in consolidated PBYs, the Navy's Catalina flying boats. But it might also have happened in Lockheed Hudson bombers, for they are teamed together too in this job. It's the sort of teamwork that is speeding victory. And the men and women of Lockheed and Vega are proud that their planes are part of the team. Ladies and gentlemen, the Lockheed and Vega Aircraft Corporations of Burbank, California, have been honored to present this evening Mr. Edward G. Robinson in the story of the anti-submarine patrol. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>